plastic bottle among the rocks reminds me that there are vast islands of garbage drifting far out at sea. A strong gust of wind reminds me of the increasingly capricious weather. And the storms that lash this and other shores of growing ferocity. The burning sunlight reminds me of melting tundra, expanding deserts, of diminishing polar ice, and rising seas all over the earth. I do my best to refocus my attention, to return home to listen. Yet, how can I stand here today and not think of these things? The earth is 4,540,000,000 million years old. The entire written history of the human species has unfolded in the 11,700 years since the most recent ice age. A brief moment of geologic time known as the Holocene. Throughout our history, we humans have altered the surface of the Earth. But over the past century or so, we've become an undeniable geological force, making deep, troubling changes to the Earth and its living systems. Today, a growing number of geologists believe we've left the Holocene and entered a new period, the Anthropocene, in which the dominant <coughs> geologic force is humanity itself. What does this mean for music? What does it mean for my work as a composer, or for any artist working in any medium today? These looming threats to the biosphere compel me to write music that is more than entertainment more than a personal narrative or a celebration of the heroic struggle of the individual. But can music be engaged with current events and at the same time detached? Can music resonate with the world around us and yet still create a world of its own? So I took a leap of faith in the belief that music and art can matter every bit as much as activism and politics. And over the years, as climate change and other global environmental threats have accelerated, and as our political systems have become increasingly dysfunctional, I've come to believe that fundamentally art matters more than politics. As a composer, I believe that music has the power to inspire a renewal of human consciousness, culture, and politics. And yet, I refuse to make political art. 
More often than not, political art fails as art, and it fails as politics. To reach its fullest power, to be most moving and most fully useful to us, art must be itself. If my work doesn't function powerfully as music, then all the poetic program notes and extra musical justifications in the world mean nothing. When I'm true to the music, when I let the music be whatever it wants to be, then everything else, including any social or political meaning, will follow. From the titles of my works, Songbird Songs, In the White Silence, Become Ocean, it's clear that I draw inspiration from the world around me. But when I enter my studio, I do so with the hope of leaving the world behind, at least for a while. Of course, it's impossible to stay, sustain that state of grace for long. Inevitably, the thoughts intrude. Sometimes I think about people, places, and experiences in my life. Sometimes I think about the larger state of the world and the uncertain future of humanity. Even so, I'm not interested in sending messages or telling stories of music. And although I used to paint musical landscapes, that no longer interests me either. The truth is, I'm no longer interested in making music about anything. Though a piece may begin with a particular thought or image, as the music emerges, it becomes a world of its own, independent of my extra musical association. In the end, those initial inspirations may remain as a title, as a program note, invitations to the listener to find their way into the music. <coughs> However, the last thing I want is to limit the listener's imagination. If a listener feels constrained by any words that I may offer along with the music, then I encourage her to ignore them. A few things make me happy that a listener who hears something, experiences something, discovers something in the music that the composer didn't know was there. It's only through the presence, the awareness, and the creative engagement of the listener that the music is complete. Sorry, folks, we were um, exactly where I want to be. So let's, um, let's go back to the right spot. Where is it?
regard more as an intrusion. For much of my life, I've made music inspired by the outdoors, but it was almost always heard indoors. Several years ago, I heard my percussion work, Strange and Sacred Noise, performed in the Enzo Borrego Desert here in California, then in the autumn woods in New England, and finally on the tundra in the Alaska Ridge. These experiences were both humbling and provocative for me. In the concert hall, Strange and Sacred Noise sounds big, powerful, overwhelming, even frightening. Outside, a lot of it just blew away in my head. So after 40 years making music inspired by the outdoors, but usually heard indoors, it finally occurred to me that it might be time to step outside, to compose music intended from the start to be heard outdoors. The result was Inuksut, for 9 to 99 percussions. Making music outdoors requires a different mode of awareness. You might call it ecological listening. In the concert hall, we seal ourselves off from the outside world. We concentrate on listening on a few carefully chosen, carefully produced sounds. Outdoors, <coughs> rather than focusing our attention inward, we're challenged to expand our awareness, to encompass a multiplicity of sounds, to listen outward. We're invited to receive messages not only from the composer and the performers, but also from the larger world around us. In Inuksuit, the musicians are dispersed widely through a large open area. Listeners, too, can move around freely to discover their own individual listening points. And it's my hope that Inuksuit just may help a little bit to expand our awareness of the never-ending music of the world around us, transforming seemingly inert space into more deeply, more fully experienced place. This is a, this is a roughly produced video. Um, there are many videos um, on the internet now of Inuksuit. But I like this one uh, from Morningside Park in New York City. Um, what it lacks in polish, I think it makes up more by capturing uh, the spirit of the moment of, of that event in that place. <clears throat>
Inuksuit is inspired by the stone sentinels that the Inuit people have constructed for centuries in the windswept expanses of the Arctic, the country that the Canadians call the Big Lonely. As I composed Inuksuit, I imagined each musician and each listener as a solitary figure in that Big Lonely. What I wasn't prepared for, what came as a delightful surprise to me, was the strong sense of community the piece seems to create. Since its premiere in the Canadian Rockies in 2009, Inuksuit's been performed all over the world, frequently, regularly. The piece has taken on an extraordinary life of its own, quite independent from the composer. And there seems to be something inherent in the piece itself that encourages community. Mounting a su successful performance of a piece like Inuksuit requires an unusual degree of cooperation among the musicians. <coughs> it also requires the active participation of the listener. And all this seems to heighten this, the sense of shared experience. Those stone sentinels in the Arctic serve a variety of functions. Some Inuksuit indicate the best route from one place to another. Some mark an especially good place for fishing or hunting caribou. Some Inuksuit are so old that their meanings have been lost in time. But they're all markers of the passing of humans in a vast landscape. The Inuktitut word Inuksuit translates literally, more or less, to act in the capacity of the human. And as I worked on the Inuksuit, my thoughts were haunted by the vision of the melting of the polar ice, the rising of the seas, and the question of what may remain of humanity's presence after the waters were seen. After Inuksuit came Sila, the breath of the world. And in these outdoor works, both Inuksuit and Sila, the musicians are dispersed widely over a large open area. There's no conductor. Every musician is a soloist. No two musicians play exactly the same part. There's no concerted playing. And each musician follows his or her own unique path through the musical and physical landscape of the piece. The same is true for the listener. There's no best seat in the house for these people. You may choose to root yourself in one location and let the music revolve around you, or you may choose to wander throughout the performance, following wherever your ears may lead you, actively shaping your own experience, creating your own mix of music. And for me, this relationship between the music and the listener simulates a human society in which we all feel more deeply engaged with the world and more empowered to help change it. Making music outdoors has also led me to a new understanding of musical polyphony. Point against point, line against line, as, as, as we understand it in the great uh, works of, of Western art music. I come to think of, of polyphony as a community of voices, an ecosystem of sound. In a performance outdoors, it's sometimes difficult to say exactly where the piece ends and the world takes over. And that's the point. Rather than a single point of interest, every point around the oral horizon becomes a potential point of interest, a call to listen. With characteristically radical eloquence, John Cage defined music simply as sounds heard. The idea that music depends on sound and listening might seem to be as self-evident as the idea that we human animals are inseparable from nature. And yet both these simple truths challenge us to pr practice ecological awareness in our individual and our collective lives. Cage's definition of harmony was sounds heard together. 
listening to the multiplicity of sounds all around us all the time, we learn to hear the marvelous harmonies they create. And hearing these harmonies, we come to understand the place of our human voices within it. Um, I'd like to play one more video clip here. Um, this is a piece called Sina, The Breath of the World, which I just mentioned. And uh, this is, um, uh, it's, it's an hour uh, or more, but um, rather than a montage that we just saw of uh, Inuxuit, this is actually real time, a few minutes, um, fairly early.
An Indian hunter scanning the horizon of the tundra for game will tell you that you learn the most by watching the edges. For most of my creative life, I've lived far removed from the centers of cosmopolitan culture. In Alaska, I imagined that I could somehow work on the outer edge of culture, drawing my music more directly from the earth. It was a uh, preposterously absurd proposition, but it was very useful. <laughs> Over, for over four decades, I listened for that music in the mountains and on the tundra, on the shoulders of glaciers and on the shores of the Arctic Ocean, and in the northern forest, learning the songs of the birds. And now I stand here, on this beach by the Pacific, still listening, immersed in the music of the sea. At night, as my wife and I sleep, it flows into the deepest reaches of my consciousness. There are moments when it sounds as if the waves would come crashing through the open windows, carry us away. And then it falls to a whisper that startles us away. Sudden still moments. I'm filled with an exquisite mixture of tranquility and dread. In the morning, I rise and do my best to break down. Some 
Sometimes change is rapid. Sometimes it's dramatic. Sometimes change is catastrophic. From an anthropocentric point of view, the changes we humans have set into motion are potentially catastrophic. Species come and species go. Sooner or later, so will we. But are we really so dead set on to put ourselves in? The most basic animal instinct is self-preservation. Might that existential instinct be enough to pull us back from the brink? Perhaps this is where biology and ethics converge. Aside from the deep ethical questions raised by our role as agents of mass extinction, extinction for so many other species. I believe we, we also have an ethical obligation to act in our own enlightened self-interest. And as we're finally coming to understand, our own self-interest is inextricably tied to the larger diversity and health of the biosphere. Unless we humans discover our proper place and learn to live in balance with a larger community of life on this earth, our future looks healthy. Our survival as a species depends on fundamental change of our way of being in the world. This is what so many of us, in music and art, in science, in education, yes, even in politics, in every field of human endeavor, are working on today. I'm a composer. My work is not activist. It's art. And yet, uh, as an artist, uh, it's impossible for me to separate my work from my life. To regard my music as somehow separate from my embeddedness in this world as a thinking human being and a citizen of the earth. If my music can inspire people to listen more deeply to this miraculous world that we all inhabit, then I will have done what I can as a composer to help navigate this perilous era of our own creation. For me, it all begins with listening.